I will turn it over to Dr. Sharif. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, my name is Dr. Shami Sharif. I'm a senior health advisor here at the Oregon Health Authority. I've been helping with the COVID-19 response. Um, thank you again for everyone uh, for being here. I'd like to provide an update on a Centers for Disease Control and Prevention investigation that has been initiated in response to the death of a person in Oregon who received the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. The individual is an Oregon resident, a woman in her 50s, who was given the Johnson & Johnson vaccine early this month. She received the vaccine prior to the CDC and FDA recommended pause on use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, a pause that Oregon also recommended for its providers on April 13th. The CDC was notified of this adverse event on April 18th and OHA was notified on April 20th. The event was a rare but serious blood clot that the woman developed within two weeks following vaccination, seen in combination with very low platelets, which are a type of clotting cell. Cases of the blood clot, known as a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, has been identified in six women around the country between the ages of 18 and 48 who received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I want to emphasize that at this time, we do not know whether the Oregon woman's death is related to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Her case had, was reported to the CDC through the VAERS system, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which is the national reporting system used to collect reports of adverse events after vaccination. Healthcare providers are required to report certain adverse events after COVID-19 vaccinations in accordance with emergency use authorizations for the vaccines. Such events include death, any life-threatening event, and inpatient hospitalization. The case in Oregon will add to the evidence of potential risk associated with Johnson & Johnson vaccine and which the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, will review to weigh the risks and benefits of the vaccine. These considerations inform the ACIP's recommendations regarding the use of the vaccine going forward and shows how the system for monitoring, quickly reporting, and investigating these events is working. The CDC and OHA will inform the public on any developments during the review and investigation process. We will also encourage everyone in Oregon to schedule an appointment for the two available COVID-19 vaccines made by Pfizer and Moderna when appointments become available. Remember that all Oregonians 16 and older are now eligible to be vaccinated. Thanks, and I'll be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Shreve. Uh, so uh, the first question uh, comes from uh, Rachel Alexander with Salem Reporter. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Sharif, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can share more details about this woman, like county of residence um, and date of death. Unfortunately, I'm not able to uh, give you the answers for either of those. Uh, county of residence and the date of death would be potentially identifiable information and is protected by patient privacy laws. Thank you. Next question is from Corey Long with KGW. Uh, yes, I was wondering, maybe not the county, can you give us a region, um, the west side, west of the Cascades, or, you know, an, an idea where in the state? I mean, we don't need to be specific county or anything like that. Uh, unfortunately, again, no, we can't report the region, and this would be in line with the CDC's reporting requirements as well. Um, this would be potentially identifying information. Thanks. Next question is from Max Goldwater with KTVZ. Hi there, yeah. Um, so the CDC tomorrow is likely going to decide on whether or not they want to resume the distribution of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. If they approve that, will OHA also begin sending out those vaccines to clinics around the state or considering today's news, will you opt not to do that? So if the CDC does make a recommendation to resume distribution of Johnson & Johnson vaccine, we have the utmost confidence that it will be a decision made with thorough investigation and consideration of the potential benefits and risks in relationship to each other as we go through this pandemic. So in that sense, we would reflect our distribution process based on the recommendations of the ACIP tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks, Max. Next question is from Jerry Howard with Newswatch 12 in Medford.
Uh, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go. Can you hear me now? Very good. What can you say about the woman's health and any underlying conditions she had? And does OHA have any other Johnson & Johnson vaccination adverse effects cases it is monitoring? Uh, at this time, I'm not aware of other cases being actively monitored. These do get reported directly to VAERS, and CDC does initiate and lead the investigations. Uh, I'm not able to comment on underlying conditions or any other demographic details for this patient. Thanks, Jerry. Next question is from Camilla Orti with KPTV. Hello, uh, my question was actually just asked, but I guess I can expand on it a little bit. Uh, is there any information the OHA can share on whether or not there's been any research uh, connecting some underlying conditions to the blood clots we've known about? Um, the CDC does a thorough review of certain underlying conditions which generally predispose individuals to higher risk of clotting in general, uh, and these are reviewed in context of this particular side effect, which is a rare type of blood clot in the vessels of the brain, but specifically in association with low platelets. Um, as of such, they will pre present a holistic argument regarding other potential triggers, but the main uh, issue here is the association of both the blood clot in relationship with the platelets being reduced. Thanks, Camila. Next question is from Christian Foden-Venzel with OPB. Yeah, hi. Um, I just want to know, you know, people who had had the J&J uh, &J vaccine, should they be worried or should uh, we pass the time now that they should be worried? For most people that receive the vaccine, we are nearing the end of that time where they need to be monitoring for symptoms. Uh, the main reason for this pause was to allow for extended monitoring of individuals who got this vaccine after March 30th and therefore would be within three weeks of vaccination. Uh, the risk of this particularly rare side effect or adverse event rather is uh, definitely only been noted within the first two weeks of vaccination and to be extra cautious the duration of time for monitoring has been set at three weeks so any individual that's passed three weeks after vaccination has less to worry about. Thanks Christian. Next question is from Jennifer Dowling with Coin TV. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know, so if women are worried, or I, I suppose men too, but what symptoms should they be looking for if they are a little bit concerned about having gotten the vaccine and they have a headache or something? You know, what, um, if I got the vaccine, what should I be aware of? What's a concern? Uh, that's a great question, and this has been something that our hospital and clinical partners have also been trying to message among uh, our patients. Uh, the main things to note are a severe uh, and unusual headache outside of a general headache that headache sufferers usually experience, uh, in addition to certain symptoms like shortness of breath, um, stroke-like symptoms, abdominal pain, or leg pain, which can indicate evidence of clotting in other parts of the body. In addition to that, some people with low platelets can present with small dots, um, noted as small microbleeds uh, in the hands and the legs. So that would be important to note as well. And the main reason to note this is that you're able to uh, note your symptoms early and uh, either call your healthcare provider or seek medical attention accordingly. Thanks, Jennifer. Next question is from Katherine Kissel from KETU. Hi, Dr. Sharif. Thanks for taking my questions. I have a couple. I know you talked about um, demographics. Can you reveal information of where this woman got the vaccine, a certain location? And second of all, are you now worried that other people are going to be discouraged to get the vaccine after hearing this news? Uh, to answer your questions, for the first question, I'm not unfortunately able to reveal the, the site of the vaccination uh, or event. 
Um, as far as ongoing uh, reluctance to get a vaccine, we acknowledge that people are experiencing trauma as a result of this ongoing pandemic, uh, as well as uh, concerns about safety uh, and efficacy of vaccines, and we want to acknowledge that. Uh, but the main thing to note is that we are very much uh, encouraged by the fact that our safety reporting mechanisms are working, and um, we do acknowledge the types of risks uh, as well as um, long-term effects that COVID-19 illness uh, can itself pose on our communities. And uh, so we weigh uh, some of these information about vaccines in light of the pandemic that we're going through. Thanks, Catherine. Next question is from Mike Benner with KGW. Hey there, doctor. A um, couple of my questions were just asked, so I'll just, I just thought about another one, but can you just, uh, elaborate again on just how rare this is. Obviously, uh, I think it's 87,000 doses or so here in Oregon, and this is the first local case, seven and a half million across the country, and now we have, what, I think seven women. Um, obviously tragic that they've passed, but I think, you know, we do need to remember how rare this is, correct? Right. Um, so this is still extremely rare. So even the case count that we're aware of so far is only about seven cases in a total of 7.5 million vaccinated across the country. Uh, additionally, uh, we do have to note that not all of the cases did result in deaths. This is, as to our uh, recognition, the second death reported so far since the investigation began. Thanks, Mike. Next question is from Amy Green with the Oregonian. Um, this is di a different question than the underlying conditions question. I'm wondering if you can talk about, did she exhibit any symptoms like severe headache or pains in her body? And I'm hoping that you don't say that they're identifying privacy concerns <laughs> to that because I think it's really helpful for people to understand like, oh, if this is happening to me, there's likely going to be some warning. So was there some warning with her? Was she hospitalized? Um, the symptoms were consistent with all the cases so far. So that's uh, that was my purpose in um, outlining that symptom list in great detail. So the main symptoms uh, across all the cases identified so far are headache. Um, some people had abdominal pain, some people had back aches, uh, depending on the location of the clotting event, in addition to events like shortness of breath, as well as um, leg pain in some individuals. So uh, this individual's, or, yeah. uh, the symptoms were all consistent. I'm sorry, I don't understand what that means. Did she have symptoms and can you say what they are? She did have symptoms and the symptoms did fall under the, the symptoms I just outlined. Okay. Was she hospitalized at the time she died? Um, yes, all of these cases were identified and treated in hospital-based settings and um, therefore their proclamation of death, if available, were, actually did come from hospital-based settings. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Next question is from Sarah Klein with the Associated Press. Hi, yes, um, I had a question about the Johnson Johnson vaccine supply. Um, currently, obviously it's on hold, but how many doses do we have? And then also, is it being distributed to certain eligible groups or in certain areas of the state or is it equal across the board? So currently, no doses of vaccine are being administered across the state as we continue in this pause. Um, as far as distribution, the distribution has been broad. It has been uh, very diverse in terms of jurisdictions as well as doses uh, distributed to different jurisdictions. The actual utilization of the vaccine does depend on a variety of logistical considerations, including storage and handling. Uh, regarding the number of doses, um, Jonathan, do you happen to have that number available of how many doses we're, we have currently in the state that's currently not being utilized? I don't have that in front of me, but we can get that. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next question comes from Jim Freddy with KXL. Thank you very much. Uh, since there is no confirmation that this death is connected to the J&J &J vaccine, as you have said, why announce it? Does it not add to the vaccine hesitancy? 
Um, this will be discussed in tomorrow's ASIP meeting. So we're actually disclosing this information for transparency as this will be one of the cases being reviewed at the ACIP discussion tomorrow. Thanks, Jim. Next question is from Ben Botkin with the Lund Report. Uh, yes, um, without identifying the provider, can you tell me, uh, have you received any information to show whether they properly handled and stored the vaccine the way it's supposed to? Have you seen any information along those lines either way? Thanks. Uh, I'm not aware of um, particulars regarding the vaccine itself that was administered to this individual. Thanks, Ben. And just an update, we've received 127,600 doses of j, &J in Oregon. We have follow-up questions. Um, this one from Jennifer Dowling with Coin6. Hi, yeah, a um, couple quick questions. Um, the dots in the skin you're talking about, I'm assuming it's red, but let me know what color it is. Like, is it purple, is it red, is it blue? And then also, um, tell me a little bit about the, the tightness of appointments. How's that going without this vaccine? So dots and, and how's it going with the appointments? Yeah, sorry. So the, the dots that I mentioned are uh, something that we call petechiae, which are just microbleeds in the capillaries as a result of low platelets. They can look either red or brown. Uh, it would vary based on the, uh, the skin of the individual. Um, as far as appointment availability in Oregon, um, they haven't dramatically changed um, because we were relying on relatively smaller do, uh, numbers of Johnson & Johnson vaccine in relationship to the mRNA vaccine uh, prior to this pause being announced. Thanks, Jennifer. Next follow-up question is from Jerry Howard with Newswatch 12 in Medford. Yes, thank you again for, for taking my question. A couple involving time frames. One is how long the lady was hospitalized before she died, and the other is uh, how long, when does OHA expect a conclusive finding by the CDC about whether the vaccination caused the death? Um, I'm not able to reveal the exact length of hospitalization because um, that could lead to identifiable information. Uh, however, I can share that her symptoms did present within two weeks of vaccination, so it's consistent with the cases observed before hers. Um, what was that second question? Remind me. Jerry, can you repeat your second question? There we go. There we go. Yes, uh, that is, uh, when does OHA expect a conclusive finding by the CDC about whether the vaccination caused the death? Um, we expect the CDC to, um, to identify and um, kind of comment on some of the remaining uh, tests that were remaining at the time of our last discussion. In addition to that, uh, it might be about a week or later before they're able to conclusively uh, decide on the cause of death for any of the individuals outlined so far. I don't have a, a whole lot of transparency into their process. Thanks, Jerry. Next follow-up question is from Camila Orti with KPTV. Hi, Dr. Sharif. Uh, my follow-up question just has to do with sort of timeline between symptom onset and death. I don't know if you have information with the organ case you can tell us on that or if they're you know based on some of the on the other six cases is, has there been a pattern between when symptoms have presented and then death um so again so the symptom onset and death uh, really are it was only available in two cases um, and it's hard to draw any conclusions from either uh, but the the symptomatology and the duration of symptoms itself has varied between individuals uh, which um, may or may not be related to their final outcome as well. Um, it, it seems to be pretty variable. I can't quite pinpoint it to a specific number, uh, but um, some individuals have presented earlier on in their symptoms versus some have presented uh, much later. Thanks, Camila. Uh, next question is from Amy Green with Oregonian. Uh, yeah, two follow-up questions. I just wanted to be sure I understood what was said earlier. So you know of no other cases in Oregon where someone had issues after the Johnson & Johnson case uh, dose, 
Right. At this Correct. time, I don't have information regarding other cases. Uh, we're just reporting the one death that we were made aware of. Okay. And then, um, so it sounds like she would have been treated um, at a hospital hospital some point at some point after April 13th. And the advisory and warning had gone out to physicians about um, the situation. I being kind of vague about this, I'm not a medical expert, but I remember hearing something about um, treatment that you should treat this differently, this blood clotting, clotting issue different than like a typical blood clotting issue and the traditional way of doing it could actually cause patients harm. Do you know if the medical staff that treated her were aware that she had received the Johnson and Johnson dose and that they had um, followed the guidance on how to treat someone with blood clotting issues who, who had received a Johnson and Johnson dose? Yes, uh, fortunately, um, the treatment uh, did occur in the wake of the announcement of the pause. Um, so the appropriate treatment was undertaken and heparin was avoided for the treatment of this patient's symptoms. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jaime. Next question is from Katherine Kissel, KHTU. Dr. Shuri, if this is a follow, um, I know you just talked about the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine in relation to deaths. Do we know how many people in Oregon have died after getting any of the vaccines, whether it's Pfizer or Moderna, and are any of these cases being investigated? So um, all death and non-death reports are investigated by the CDC. Um, we have a uh, we have numbers in the uh, the double digits um, in the teens for deaths um, in the setting of or following vaccine in general. Uh, most of these deaths have been concluded as related to COVID-19, and these deaths are more common in people who have been partially immunized between basically their two doses of mRNA vaccine or prior to two weeks of completion after their J&J &J vaccine. Uh, so most of the deaths have uh, fallen in this category. Uh, we continue to um, continue to have reports of deaths and non-deaths reports reported to the CDC and the CDC continues to investigate them as they come. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Uh, we don't have any other questions in the queue, so we'll go ahead and uh, end this. If you have any follow-up questions, please do submit them to our COVID media box, which is orcovid19.media at dapsoha dot state dot or dot us and uh, thank you dr shreef and thank you everyone for joining us